Well, welcome everybody uh, to another session of the Inner Circle Bible Study. Tonight, we are going to enter into the study, Who is the Holy Spirit? Um, our brother Craig Prentice is going to lead us in this discussion. Um, there's going to be a lot of information. I know there is, um, and I'm excited for it. And uh, we're just going to go where the Holy Spirit leads us and and let him take off of that. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Craig. Go ahead, brother. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to, this one's, <laughs> this was a complicated, this was so easy and so hard um, because who is the Holy Spirit is, um, it's answered easily as one third of God, but it's also the expansiveness of one third of God. So, uh, I thought I should bring us into, because a lot of times we, we hear about the Trinity, we know about Father, we know about Jesus, Holy Spirit is a touchy subject, and a lot of, um, I don't know if I should just say religion, or it, it starts getting weird because people are apprehensive about the Spirit, um, and you say spirit instead of ghost because ghost is scary and spirit is not. It's it's funny all of the rabbit trails that we can go down and all the different rabbit trails that we've heard about even in, in religion. So I, I really wanted to share a little bit of the Old Testament Holy Spirit. And the Old Testament Holy Spirit was actually the Lord of Hosts. And the Lord of Hosts is actually defined, and I'm not going to get deep into this, but um, he's defined as the warring spirit. It was his job to hold the cosmic alignment of the stars to allow Jesus to come to earth, be born in the flesh, live his life, and make it to the cross. Everything, all of the attempts of the enemy to block him, everything that... Um, Everything that was stirring around the Holy Spirit, we can attribute to making sure that that Father's will made it through. So when we get to the cross, the Holy Spirit or the Lord of hosts role change. And in that change, after the cross... As Jesus said, he's called the Holy Spirit, and his role is as our comforter. So that's a really neat transition as far as who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? Well, he's the king of the spirits. He's king of all spirits. So I wanted to share the magnitude of the Holy Spirit, because a lot of times we see Father as uh, as big of a role as Father has, and then we know the relationship that's called for for Jesus, and it's a little hard to put your finger on something that you can't see, and the Spirit is there for us, but it's also more like working with the wind you can feel it you know he's there you can feel the breeze but you can't grab hold or you don't have a visual reference so um it takes on a different a, a different form we have to work with him outside of a form that we're actually used to or are comfortable with to start out with so I'm going to I'm going to actually give a lot of foundation and scripture um which I would much rather jump in and and get into the relational part um but I think we need to at least start with understanding but I don't want to lean on um oh wow we didn't even pray did we <laughs> I thought you were going to start out with that. Um, 
yeah, let's let's do the prayer. So thank you, Father, for all that you're doing, all that you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've what you've set up and prepared. Lord, just open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Allow us to receive a message, receive the the indwelling and the education that we can follow your steps and your guidance. And I thank you for all that you've established and all that you wrote in all of our destiny books. In Jesus' name, Lord, bless this teaching. Amen. Amen. So before I get to the verses, I want to actually cover a little bit of something. But I think I need to probably also prepare. The world teaches us to, we were all born with intelligence. And then the world teaches us to fill our file cabinets, which is basically our brain with information. To really get to know the Holy Spirit is not about what you can, what you can actually stuff into your own understanding. What you're going to do with the Holy Spirit is through invitation and through relationship. And it'll be a dramatic change in your life. So no matter what step, what level you're at and in, in understanding, I want you to be open to receiving in the spirit, receiving through the heart and feel what you can feel. And, and the more you exercise your feeler, the more you will um, understand engaging with the spirit. So this isn't, as much as I'd love to say, this isn't about book knowledge. And this isn't about how much book knowledge that you can cram in your head. So especially dealing with spiritual matters, which obviously the Holy Spirit 100% spirit. Um, that's where we're going to go. So <clears throat> let's understand a couple things. Holy Spirit is subject to us. He's one third God, but yet he works with revelation. He, we work with him through revelation And just because we get revelation doesn't mean, well, I got it right now and I need to go do it. You might get revelation in the middle of church service, and he's not saying, jump up, break up the service, go to somebody. Hey, I got a word for you, or I got this, or it, it's a matter of, oh, okay, thank you for that. And as soon as the door opens, I can't wait to share that. And I promise you, he'll always open the door. So let him work with you. Um, I think we forget a lot. And I'm just trying to set up before we get into the verses of foundation. I wanted to kind of break the ice so that's why I'm kind of thinking about what I'm, how I'm actually approaching. But I think we all need to remember that mankind was first spirit before flesh. So when Jesus actually came and fulfilled, he opened the door back to the garden for us because he became the second Adam. He fixed the problem of sin and flesh. So the door opened, although now maybe more so hybrid, but the door opened for now we can access spirit and flesh. So that creates a choice. I'm going to cover and share the verse later on about how we work in the flesh and how we work in the spirit and, and how that works out. So just remember, before everything, right at the very beginning, Adam and Eve were in spirit before the sin, before mankind developed into flesh, 
Jesus restored that connection. So I think a lot of times we forget about that. So I just wanted to touch base there. By hybrid, do you do you re, do you mean by that like uh, co-laboring? Uh, flesh and spirit. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for those that have either heard of or even worked in deliverance, I wanted to share that while we're talking about the spirit <laughs> and spirits, that we need to also know that we are a possessible kind. Now, in possession, that would be the bad guy side. So, have we ever asked the question, why? Because God never intended that we fill our house with unclean spirits. It's truly a trap of the enemy and a choice and agreement based on deception and lies. And that's how the enemy gains access to us. Now, the cool thing is we can change all of that with truths. Because there's good, there, there's good side, there's bad side. And now I'm just talking in spiritual. So, and this will actually tie in with good fruits and bad fruits. Because that's how they're displayed. We'll know them through their fruit. So... With the, with the bad guy's side, we'll know it as possession because not only did we accidentally agree with the enemy, but yet when, when they get that agreement, they're trying to take that kingdom by force. The opposite side, when we get over to the Holy Spirit, is through invitation only, we have access to the Holy Spirit. Because he's a perfect gentleman, just like Jesus, just like Father. See, three in one, but each one in absolute unity, we can know them individually, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. So we can be restored through bad agreements, deception, and lies through the blood and the truths bring us back into the good fruits, the good spirits and the good guy side. So I say that on a lower level, but remember with the Holy spirit, we're dealing with the King spirit. He's the top notch, the highest of high in the spirit part the the one third of the trinity he's over the spiritual now the amazing thing is by actually keeping in mind we were spirit first and we're going back to that when when all of this is actually wrapping up we'll be in spirit form because spirit form there is no death in spirit but in flesh just like Genesis said, you shall surely die. So the earth suit it will be shed. And, and then we will carry on in spirit. And the king of the spirits, all spirits, Holy Spirit. So um, So the word actually tells us, and it makes perfect sense. God always intended on giving us the most incredible gift. And that's the infilling of the King spirit partnership, walking in agreement, always learning, being led by the Holy spirit. And the part of God that he gave as a present, it was going to benefit us. As Jesus said, it benefits us more if I step away, but don't worry, I'm giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's amazing to me how a lot of, in religion, religion has a form of godliness, as this is in 
first Timothy uh, chapter three, a, a form of godliness without power, because the power literally comes from the indwelling and the Holy Spirit. It's the operation of the spirit, because that power is not anything that we have. It's his power that's waiting for our activation. We call it. And then he'll catch he'll catch our words. It's it's an amazing relationship and it's amazing how the co-laboring works. So at a quick glance, I want to start off with the roles. And I always like Exodus, Exodus 23, 25. The verse says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and I will bless your bread and your water. And I, you will worship the Lord your God. And then Father says, and I will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. So the Lord Jesus, to be our God, and Father's still going to bless our, our bread and our water and remove sickness. And this is Old Testament. So I, I love that, the perception of he's giving us the Lord. And honestly, the Lord's earning us because he went through all the steps all the way to the cross. And then he won us at, over. So the Lord is ours. He was it, by design. In Psalms 51, 10 and 11, David wrote, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So we're getting kind of both sides of the fence dealing with the presence and the Holy Spirit the clean heart and the steadfast spirit within me the more steadfast that we become the more we're steadied on our feet and the less double minded we are I mean is that making sense The Holy Spirit, and, and I actually perceive this in the entire category of spirit. It's very, I don't want to say rigid, but there is, there is more grace in Jesus than you'll find in the spirit. The spirit is um, very much one way. It is the way it is. It is right. It is true. It is steadfast. And it doesn't change. The angels don't understand us because we flip flop. And they've had instruction where they're like, why would they do that? The Bible says this. So that's why we do it. They don't question it. It's just the way it is. So when we kind of understand that, we start to understand a little bit more in the way of the spirit. So what you're saying is he's more, it is literally more black and white. It is. Very, it, and that's it. There is no gray area. There's no, you, there's no making room and, and there's no uh, compromising in that, in, in his instruction. Although we think there is. Uh, well, it, and <laughs> Yes, absolutely. 100%. We do. We, we get it messed up. But thank God that there's grace with Jesus because we're learning. You know, if there's if there's anything that that you can pick up and stand solid on, there's nowhere in the Bible that he asks for perfection. He asks for righteousness. So we lost perfection before we even knew what the word was. But righteousness Amen. means freshly repented. So as long as we, as long as we're freshly repented, we're changing our ways, and and He's making a way to get our mess cleaned up. So, 
the spirit doesn't join us when we're jacked up. That walks me into the next verse, <laughs> I think. Let me see here. Yes, and Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he became their enemy. He himself fought against them. That's that rigid black and white. It The truth is the way is this is the way heaven was intended to be. And he holds the line. I'm going to jump on to uh, open up a little bit further, and then I'm going to kind of back off of this point. Um, in Matthew 12, 31 and 32, when working with the Holy Spirit, we need to understand this. It says, therefore, I tell you, and this may be some of the reason why in religion, they're, they get timid about the Holy Spirit. So at Matthew 12, 31 and 32, therefore, I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin and blasphemy. But blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the, the son of man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Either in this age or the age to come. It is an eternal sin is what they're saying in, in the passage here. So it's one thing to be mistaken about Jesus. He has the grace, he has the blood of forgiveness, and he's issuing it. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we don't talk about, we don't, we really need to be careful about speaking against the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does hold the line. That's his role. That's very, very important. But as long as you stand in spirit with him, you'll be amazed what happens. So we have a identity crisis with God because a lot of times we don't understand why bad things happen. And a lot of times we'll naturally blame God for allowing bad things to happen. But if, if as you mature in, in your learning process, you'll learn where, all things good and great come from God. All things bad and terrible come from the devil. Now, God uses bad and terrible and turns it for good. So, you know, but we tend to be spoiled rotten brats. So it's, well, he let something bad happen to me and he shouldn't have. So that's probably one of the very common learning curves coming straight into your position with God, most of the time it, you're already tackling that. I'll, I'll bet you the majority of us have had to tackle that in the early parts of, of our salvation and, and, and working out our salvation with Christ. So um, When we understand that in everything that God does, so Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, everything in each one of their roles, they always will stand with us to set us up for success without fail. Even if we don't have it right, Holy Spirit may back up. Jesus moves in. Okay. It, the bases are covered. He sets us up for success every time without fail. He doesn't set traps for us to, to fail. It, it's, that's not his job. We, we have someone else that we need to overcome when we're stumbling and we're, when we're having those issues. And that's understanding spiritual Good, good guy side, bad guy side, okay? So 
Um, in Mark 13, 9 through 11. And, and I'm sharing a lot of this because I don't generally just hammer you on verses, but I wanted to have a good foundation to, to base this from because there's so much of the Holy Spirit that I don't think that we operate with, but it's available. So if we start foundationally, it's the sky is not even the limit. So in Mark 13, 9 through 11, as for yourselves, beware. For they will hand you over to the councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. When they bring you to trial and hand you over, this is a really cool promise. Do not worry beforehand on what you are to say, but Say whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So in the time of trouble, in the hour of your need, when you actually come in, be open for him to come in and work with you, work through you, because I promise it comes to you to go through you. So if you're in receive mode, you're going to operate, and I'm lit up in spirit. You're going to receive to then hand it out. It's got to come to, to go through. So a broader perspective on who Jesus will put in. Uh, let me start that over. A broader perspective on who Jesus will put in front of you. Remember, by the word of your testimony. Also notice. He doesn't start class early. I hear all the time. He hasn't told me. Oh, I think I'm supposed to move. But he hasn't given me my answer. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. That's not what the, that's not how the Holy Spirit operates. This is amazing. When we get to, when we get here, he very much, works on the fly in the very same hour of your need. I've come to understand that if I get it too early, I play with it, I twist it up, I call it Play-Doh, everything he gives me, I play with it and play with it until it doesn't even look like what he gave me. So when, when we catch his revelation on the fly, we tend to catch it and share it, and we don't change it. And that's why he comes in. That I say it a lot. And I hope I'm not going to get in trouble with it. But he's never early, and but he's always on time. He's never been late, but he's never as early as we want him to be. So... Um, in Luke, they actually shared the same thing with the trials, a little bit different perspective. It says, when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, the authorities, do not worry about how you are to defend yourself or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. So if we're waiting, oh, I can't move forward. I don't have any answers know that he's got you you're not a you're not abandoned you're not an orphan and he's got you so in that faith it gives us that door of faith that we can operate in and we walk right in with it and then he just comes in and shows out and we can walk away going wow wow that was cool so Understanding the very hour is so important <laughs> because I promise the more you work with them, the more you'll actually recognize that. So, uh, I think we also need to, I think we need to believe in them enough that we should stand on the promises too. So we need to, we need to know about the Holy spirit. We need to know about the promises. Um, 
and the operation. So in Luke 2, 25 and 26, it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolidation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord Messiah. So the Lord's Messiah. When you get a word from the spirit, very much as the same with Jesus, it is absolute truth. It may not look like what you're expecting. It may not, it, it may not unfold the way you expected. But when he says it, you can bank on it. It's going to happen. It is absolute truth. We sometimes have that trust factor because we've actually had the trust. We've learned trust by the world and, and the way Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit actually operate is absolute truths. So that's that's really... I mean, we can miss it, but I promise the word that's the, the word that he shares is what we need to hear in perfection. So I didn't footnote the uh, the verse with this one. I think. I'll read it. it says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if I ask the father, he will, okay. He will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. So one of the things that I wanted to point out here is the word advocate. So not only has he been our comforter, not only is he the spirit of truth, not only does he give us revelation Advocates defined as one that argues for a cause, a supporter or a defender. Let me tell you, when I when I have a spirit in intercession for me, that's what I want. That's what I need. Another can you, can you say that again, Craig? The advocate, what? One that argues for a cause, a supporter or a defender. Now, the second meaning, one that pleads on another's behalf, an intercessor. So, very important to understand what he's saying, because if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. He's giving you one who will stand in court for you. I just think that's super cool. That is the spirit. This is the spirit of truth. And the world will not cannot receive because it neither sees them or knows them. But as for us, we know him because he abides with us and he will be in us. That's why we actually invite him for the infilling. Um that was John, I think it's John 14, Greg. Yeah, I thought I John actually... John 14, 15. It starts with John uh, 14, 15. Yeah. Um, I really thought I highlighted that out of the verse. And to, and I don't know if we want to... I'm going to read that. I'm going to read John 14, and I'm going to carry it from 15 to 31, because I think it's very important. There's promises here. 
So in a little in a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. I'm, I, I'm just going to keep reading. <laughs> I could break off and have fun right there. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will, will be loved by my Father. And I'll love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from, but is from the father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave you, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. That's a statement of Indian givers. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you will rejoice that I am going to the father because the father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. But I do, as the Father has commanded me, so the world may know that I love the Father. Rise and let's be on our way. So, just a ton. And we could dissect this for weeks. But... That's the, that was the program on how it was all going to unfold. He's leaving us the spirit. He's not leaving us high and dry. And in fact, in Romans 14, 17, it says for the kingdom of God, this is something that's very, very important. I've always looked at the kingdom of God as a place of, of heaven. When we get into the, the, the fruits of the spirit, it actually says, if you have the bad fruits, the kingdom of God will not come to you. So the kingdom of God is not what we actually, my assumption was it was, it was heaven. But by this verse right here, it says, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when we have righteousness, peace, and joy in filling us with and as the Holy Spirit, we've now achieved the kingdom of God. It's it's way more personal than I ever thought it was. I never, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> so, but a huge, huge thing. Um, another thing with the Holy Spirit. Because not only is he working on creating the new mind, but he's actually giving us a conscience. He's giving us our bearing of right and wrong. And in Romans 9, 1, <clears throat> says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, we don't have a bearing, we don't have a compass, and we can very easily make God into our, our own image. But with the Holy Spirit, he's already working on, 
our identity on who we are and who God is so we actually can get a glimpse at what we should be instead of, well, I do this, but I'm sure he's okay with it. That whole step can get skipped because of where the Holy Spirit is teaching us and pulling on our conscience saying, ah, 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 ah. that's a bad route. So the other thing that was actually uh, brought up and it's 2 Timothy 1 and 14. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. I can't even think of a greater treasure. He's our helpmate. He's our teacher. He's our comforter. It's amazing to me on why there is such apprehensiveness to accept the Holy Spirit. To work with the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one, even, and I'm jumping to the end, Benny Hinn wrote a book, and and it's a great book, and it's called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. He gets up in the morning, and he says, Good morning, Holy Spirit. He starts his dialogue out with Holy Spirit. But also in the book, he said something that really jumped out at me because he then follows up, follows up with, what do you want to teach me about Jesus today? That's his job. That's what he's here for. We don't understand. We don't, we don't even come close to comprehending Jesus even here on earth but Holy Spirit does. So in that, in that ability of holding the line, he brings us up to the standard, the standard we didn't even know. And it's so important. And you'll find if you take out the pen and you ask him that question and get ready to write, you'll be amazed of the paragraph that follows. And, and he'll do that with you every day. He'll do that with you multiple times a day. As much as you want to give him, he works 100% by invitation. So through the invitation, as a perfect gentleman, he's waiting for us to engage with him. And then he starts giving us nuggets. It's beautiful. Um, I highly recommend... And I and I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read it tonight because I know this is already gonna be long, but I'm gonna recommend Hebrews 9 for everybody to actually read. Um because there's there's so much structure in the hierarchy of uh, of Father Jesus and Holy Spirit. So I'm going to include the part that actually talks about the Holy Spirit, but this actually comes from Hebrews 9, 1 through 22. Um, we're probably somewhere around verse 9 or 10, um, where it actually talks about the Holy Spirit. And it says, by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary has not been disclosed as long as the first tent is still standing. This is a symbol of the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipers, but deal only with the food and drink and various baptisms, regulations for the body imposed until the time comes to set things right. See, we haven't got into the perfected place because of the enemy is still fulfilling prophecy. Does that is I hope that actually helps kind of clear up for 
the time the time comes to set things right. So I wanted to share that. Um, it also says, and part of the reason why we struggle with the Holy Spirit is actually accessing our spirit man. What does it mean to actually step into the spirit? Because to work with the Holy Spirit, we have to stop being deaf and dumb while being in the flesh. So when we step into spirit, then we operate with Holy Spirit. So, and, and this is actually covered in Romans 8, 5 through 8. And it said, for those who live accordingly to the flesh, their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. So, there's a there it just said there's a divide between flesh and spirit to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind in, on the spirit is life and peace for this reason the mind is set on the flesh the the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to god it does not submit to god's law indeed it cannot. And those that are in the flesh cannot please God. So that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk in according, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it says very clearly, <clears throat> as we operate in spirit, we will flow with spirit and we will please God because we are no longer deaf and dumb to the things of the spirit. If we don't check in with God, how can we get direction? If you're on the battlefield, if you're a soldier, you've got to get orders from the hierarchy. They've got to give direction or you're just a soldier running rogue. And that's what we do in the flesh. Even if we have good intent, if we're in the flesh and we're not checking in with God and we do that through the spirit, this is an access door through the Holy Spirit that we start getting direction. We start hearing where we're supposed to be. We start being obedient because we're hearing and then doing his will based on his timing. It's the grand slam. So, Holy Spirit is only available if we walk in spirit, not flesh. He intercedes for us like watching a train wreck. He sees it coming. He intercedes for us, and he keeps asking, please, step back into spirit. Step back into spirit. I've got something to share. You don't see the train coming. I can help. But until we step into the step out of the flesh and get into spirit can he can he rescue that moment so he intercedes on our behalf and we suffer through if we stay in our own free will so that's how big that's how huge it is to have and walk with holy spirit so i'm going to kind of i'm going to wrap this up so we can have dialogue because I already know I've already over, <laughs> way overrun. <laughs> Look at the fruits of the Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit becomes your conscience. The Spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit that will not take sides and will only stand with truth. So Holy Spirit is... Therefore, I am a great treasure. 
when he comes into me, I start representing him. So everything he is, I become. Because it's obedience. That's the whole benefit of the infilling that was given to us. So I'm going to say it kind of repeatedly because he gave me Holy Spirit is, therefore I am. As soon as I'm in spirit, that's a true statement. Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman, invitation only. Holy Spirit is, therefore I am, in relationship. Holy Spirit is, therefore I am, a stabilizer. Holy Spirit is, therefore I am, power. Holy Spirit is, therefore I am, an advocate. See, the same thing applies. It's coming to you to go through you. So everything he is, as long as I'm operating in spirit, therefore I am too. So I am a revelator. I am an intercessor. I am our teacher. I am omnipresent and a part of the omnipotent Godhead. <coughs> I am king over all spirits, including where the Holy Spirit is also over the spirits of man. Again, Holy Spirit is, therefore, I am friend. It's all in relationship because he's in, he's around, he's on, in, and around, always for us in our benefit. And when we actually tap in and, and walk in that obedience, we change the world and we bring the, the, the victorious trophy home to Father. And I'm going to leave it at that. Amen. Amen. That's, that's a powerful, powerful statement. And, 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 you know, that's something that could, could go for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. Holy <laughs> is therefore I am, you know, that's, that's a lot to unpack right there. And <laughs> thanks. That's a good one to end on for sure. Um, Cause it's one that makes you ponder. Um, but man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is uh I, I, we could tell, I, I could tell Shannon was saying the same thing. You could tell you were really, really tr trying to keep it down here. <laughs> so yeah, we could see that you were trying. So, I was, I am. Um, I, I walk in a great relationship and, and I don't have an exclusive. Mm -hmm. There is so much that is readily available. There's so much of the Holy Spirit, that he is so much of the part of my life and ministry. When you step into that, you get it too. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not exclusive. I, there's not a single pastor out there that, that can say what I have, you can't have. Correct. Because yeah. everything of God is actually yours. Mm -hmm. If you receive it and you invite him. Yeah. I think the one important thing that you mentioned too, and you reiterated it quite a few times as you were just, you know, kind of summarizing that up. Um, and I think that it's, it's important to kind of really foot stomp is that when it's, when we are in Christ, that, that is an important term that in Christ, anything outside of Christ, if you're trying to operate in the flesh, if you're trying to operate in your own abilities, if you're trying to operate in your own, what you think is your gift, because really essentially we'll get into that next week or, you know, in the, in the weeks to come about gifts, but understanding that it's as he wills, right? So Holy Spirit is, therefore I am, if I'm in Christ. And, and that's the key term is that making sure that we are in Christ and that happens through uh, death to flesh. 
but it's a it's a recurring thing every i mean continually it has to be a recurring thing and if it's not then it rises back up and you know yeah i think it was actually in hebrews 9 but it actually there has to be blood there there has to be blood for forgiveness and and jesus offered what was not cow was not animal was he offered his own and through that there is forgiveness and what i did not actually cover on the presumption that we we have christ and we understand this let's not leave it out though the promise of the holy spirit is actually only after we accept christ and then the the promise is he will come shortly thereafter but then we also need to understand by invitation so that's yeah i I didn't cover that there's so much to cover Mm and there was you know i don't want to leave stuff out but yeah that's I was hoping that to be understood in the fundamentals, but yeah. thank you for bringing that up. Cause that is, it, that's very solid. Yeah. Very foundational and identity too, is when we understand that, you know, I, I think too often um, in the world of religion, you get a false sense of superiority because, uh, because whatever that religious dialect, so to speak has, morphed from the original intent uh that's what it tries to teach you and i think when you when we operate in that realm that's where we kind of become limited you know and it's so much easy it's so much easier than i think than most of us try to make it out to be we try to make it out to be so complex that uh, you know this and that and this gift and that gift well just operate in christ and be in him make sure that you're you've got all the junk out right make sure you flush the toilet <laughs> so to speak, get all the stuff out, get all the flesh out, and then just let him do what he wants to do. Yeah, don't forget about the static cling of heaven, because you'll know that's the Holy Spirit. Mm. Amen. Amen. Goosebumps, Holy Spirit bumps. I don't like calling them goosebumps, but yeah, it's you'll know the, the presence of the Spirit's upon you. You'll feel it. Yeah, usually usually accompanied by butterflies in the stomach. The rivers of boiling water. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, Sister Sue, go ahead. Hey, um, I'm having trouble keeping up with the phone here, but um, this is exactly what I studied about today, John 14. <laughs> I read everything there about the Holy Spirit, uh, doing some research on it, and it is, it is so, so much. Uh, to try to cover but everything he read in john 14 i read all that today and it's like the lord just helped me to give me understanding more about you know but why is the holy spirit so important why is it so bad i guess to blaspheme the holy spirit because jesus paid the highest price he paid he was he was god's son and he paid the ultimate price. Every drop of blood he gave for you and me so that the Holy Spirit could come into our life to be that gateway to save us, to, to lead and teach and guide and direct us while we walk on this earth. That Holy Spirit, there was a high price paid. We don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit spirit because of the price that was paid to give him to us so that we can live and breathe and like brother said walk in the spirit and when we realize really realize this you know that we can walk in in the holy spirit and there are conditions to it you know if we truly love jesus if we really follow his commandments you know the Holy Spirit's going to be right there. He will answer our prayers. He will talk to us and we can talk to him. He will intercede for us when we can't even intercede for ourselves. He will pray through us to God the Father. And they're all listening. Jesus and God is listening. You know, there there is so much. You know, I was speaking to somebody today. There's a lot of Christians that are saved. They love Jesus. 
but they're absolutely terrified and afraid of really of the moving of the Holy Spirit, you know, allowing him to really move in their life, you know, and that's just a trick of the enemy that this is like a secret that the devil does not want so many Christians to know or realize that they can be filled. There's an infilling of the Holy Spirit and it's powerful. He is powerful, you know, to give you that power and strength to live how we need to live as Christians. But I do have a, a question. Um, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, you know, after he died, he promises the comforter, the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, all the people like John the Baptist, now they were baptized in the faith. You know, they believed who Jesus was. Did they, was the Holy Spirit enter their heart when they got saved? How did that kind of work? They I, they believed by faith, but did they have the Holy Spirit that entered their heart? How, how did that work? I'll summarize. Um, one of the verses, and I didn't really dig on it, but one of the verses I talked uh, that I read through tonight actually talked about various baptisms. So the various baptisms, uh, Acts 19 is a good example. Um, I, I love the chapter, and amazingly enough, well, I generally, that's my go-to with the Holy Spirit. I wasn't directed there, but I'll summarize it. They came in excited. Hey, have y'all been baptized in this new movement? And they're like, well, yeah. And he's like, well, great. Which one? Uh, what do you mean, which one? Well, we had the baptism of water. Oh, good. John's baptism of repentance. So the water baptism related to repentance, which is why we can do repeatedly. You can't get enough of water baptism because, I mean, we step in it all the time. At least I do. So, you know, I, I love getting baptized again because that's the baptism of repentance. But then he turned around to say, but have you been baptized of the spirit and fire? And they looked at each other and went, no, we've not even heard of such. So then Paul started teaching of the spirit and received special um, miracles that day because he taught on the spirit and encouraged the baptism of spirit and fire. So then it goes down farther into Acts 19. And when... I loved it because Paul actually split a church, took took some men in to train them up. He was discipling them. Some were stuck in tradition. He sent them back. And one guy was going along, but he wasn't getting it. And so when he was actually, when they were there and the, and the demon challenged him, he says, I know who you are, Paul. I don't know who you are, but I don't know who you are. And that guy ended up getting his, his tail handed to him and, and, and tore off his clothes. And, I mean, he was a wreck. He didn't have the power, and the demon just whooped him right there. So the power in us that gives us that dominion comes in spirit. Because the one who was just going with the flow but didn't receive spirit in Acts 19, he had his butt handed to him. So uh, that's where in the multiple or various baptisms, we actually come inviting of the Holy Spirit and, and we progress. So there's promises of him to come uh, in Joel and Acts 2. Joel 2 and Acts 2, both are the promises of the Spirit to come. So I hope that helps. Does that help too? Well, yeah, some. So I know they the people got baptized in the water. Okay. And it was, they repented of their sins and they got baptized. But did they receive anything like the Holy Spirit into their heart when they repented and got baptized? Are they just simply accepted by faith? And they repented because they knew the law. They knew John was telling them the truth. 
and they accepted and believed that Jesus, you know, was was God's son and they, they had sinned and they accepted him into their heart and they knew that they repented through the water baptism. But did they actually receive, I guess, anything in their heart and not until after Jesus was crucified. After he was crucified, the Holy Spirit came, you know, in, in filling came, you know, gave the 120, the infilling, the power, and then he progressed from there, you know. But all those that were baptized under water through like John's baptism, it was through repentance, that's true. But did they receive like anything within their heart or just by faith? They knew this was true and they repented. Hey. They weren't, um, so since this was before the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit wasn't living inside of anybody. The Holy, the Holy Spirit wasn't on earth because God pulled away the Holy Spirit back in Genesis when the sin of man. So then when Jesus came to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, when that happened after he died and then rose again and then ascended back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came back down because Jesus fulfilled his mission of coming back down. So now... What's happening is when they were baptized before that, they're accepting the gospel. They're accepting the good news. And the Holy Spirit is not in them physically. If that makes sense. They actually also uh, a lot teach on the dove that came down on uh, on Jesus when he right after he was water baptized. And that was representing of the spirit coming down on him. Yeah, so that's. But but as but far as yeah. he had, he had knowledge. So that's why I like Acts 19, because the invitation through the teaching of Paul to know there is another baptism and it's not water. It's the, wow. the next baptism is the invitation of the spirit to not only come to us, but indwell us. Right. So it, it is actually, it, it is a an additional optional step, um, and I say I say optional because I've come out of religion that has a form of godliness without power, and when the power shows up, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, so they were saved. They were saved, Christians, you know but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they were saved as far as they were accepting Christ. They were accepting Jesus. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm asking. Even though the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit hadn't come as far as the indwelling, you know, being filled no. with the Holy Spirit. That hadn't come yet because Jesus was still here. But there yeah. was true repentance from all those that got saved and were baptized, you know, they they received it by faith, you know, John's preaching. But was there I, I, I don't know, was there an actual change in their heart? Did the Holy Spirit enter their heart? Because I know the Holy Spirit always come upon people, you know, guiding them, directing them. The Holy Spirit always came upon people to prophesy, to show miracles and signs. But during well, that particular time when there was John there, the forerunner of jesus and all these people got saved you know they repented and they got saved and they got baptized you know was what happened to their heart i guess is what i'm trying to understand because when we get saved now when we truly believe and we accept jesus into our heart and people do you know you feel that transformation in your heart you know you feel that 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 complete new creature you feel that transformation by the Holy Spirit, yeah. you know, and then, you know, as you progress in your walk, you know, you start seeking more of the Holy Spirit that, you know, you got saved, then, you know, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you about getting filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, if, if you truly want to follow him down that, that road, you know, and yeah. he will do it. I, I honestly but, think, I, I don't think that there's going to be a definitive, um, verse or evidence but my understanding which can be wrong but my perspective is um there's a lot of people that have accepted christ and the whole 
Spirit can come to them. But the infilling will only be by invitation, as far as what I've ever witnessed. Yes, so, I, I, yes. That, yeah. is, that is correct. Because when you, yes. there's a difference between getting baptized. Baptism is when your old sinful body is dying and you're coming up a new creation. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is a whole different thing. That's a choice yes. that you, you make if you want to let the Holy Spirit in. So when they yeah. got baptized, the Holy Spirit couldn't enter in their hearts because, number one, the Holy Spirit wasn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit had to happen yet because Jesus was still on earth. So when the Holy Spirit couldn't enter into their hearts because their hearts were still sinful. So what they did was like when the dove came, the Holy Spirit was in Jesus because Jesus was a Trinity. So he had the Holy Spirit inside of him. The Holy Spirit dwelled in him. Right. So he was functioning under the Holy Spirit. But as far as man, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in their hearts because they were still sinful. Their bodies were still, Christ hadn't died for their sins yet. Right. So this by faith, they simply believed by faith and repented until, right. until the Holy Spirit actually came after Jesus was crucified and the Holy Spirit came and then they were introduced to the power of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the infilling definitely after the cross. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Because because Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. Right. The Holy Ghost is the one that draws you onto the altar of repentance, right? That's the right. one that brings yeah. you to salvation. Salvation is through Jesus. The water baptism is the is the baptism of repentance. And then right. Jesus is the one that baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. That's where that invitation that Craig was talking about comes from. Right. And We've you got... have to see you have to seek him. You have mm -hmm. to you have to want him and seek him for that infilling. Mm -hmm. That is true. And there is a difference of on versus in. Yes. That's, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where I've had, I, I've had people in religion say, you know, I cannot believe that you, that you would say, I don't have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and it wasn't, I wasn't trying to throw daggers. I was just trying to say without actually going to, well, you have to have the evidence of speaking in tongue because you don't. Right. It the, the the spirit is not, um, it is not any part of salvation other than the promise of power after salvation. Yes, so correct. He's the teacher and he's the guidance and and he is the tool that we have to bring yes. us up to a standard that brings us a, a prayer language that is that cannot be interfered with because the devil can't understand it and we can release it on earth, but yes. it has nothing to do with salvation because That's salvation true. is secured through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ. Then the spirit comes in. Yes. After. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good deal. Good deal. Chris, go ahead. I think they kind of touched base on it, but if I'm not mistaken, the Holy Spirit rested on Jesus when he got baptized, but the only other time that the Holy Spirit showed presence is when he sent them out, um, his disciples out, and they was doing miracles. They would have had to have the Holy Spirit with them then, correct? But it wasn't in them, it was with them, as yeah. Craig said. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then when he died, then the upper room got filled with the Holy Spirit and that's where the Holy Spirit come within people, correct? Or when he died? After his death, then, yeah. yeah. At Pentecost. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. You good, Chris? Yeah, I was just trying to understand it along with Miss Sue. I, it kind of got answered. I was just running it through my mind. You good? No, these, yeah, these, 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 these are good great. questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We need to tackle this because once you get in and you start, once you realize that there's more, it's not just learning about a guy named Jesus, that there's operating in power and that there's the, the, the speaking of miracles and they, and they happen. You start to actually share this with other people and they're like, Oh, I have Holy Spirit, but but those kind of things don't happen. So, and 
And it's amazing the level of offensive that that you can find when you're just trying to share, I found something greater, there's more. And if you tell somebody there's more, a lot of times they take offense to that. Like, well, I can't believe that you would sit there. And, but <laughs> we all need to understand there's so much more of God. Even the more that I've got is not anywhere close to what God has to offer. There's always more. So. Real quick, Sheila, no, he's, Sh Sheila said, are you saying you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues? And that's not what he said. No, no. Yeah, it he's is. Saying, not. He's saying that there, that, that, so that's what the church kind of, lots of times the church will say, you're that you're not you're not filled with spirit if you don't speak in tongues and yeah that's that's that was their benchmark for evidence of the holy spirit is mm -hmm. by speaking in tongue um but there's there's five different and this is very seldomly ever touched on there's five different types of tongues mm -hmm. I, I can that's, I, a, that's, I, that's for a whole nother discussion oh absolutely oh, i mean absolutely. i absolutely agree with the baptist that that through the power of the tongues and the interpretation of tongues, the Baptists were right in the beginning of Acts. I have mm -hmm. no argument with that. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same in the other parts. When you get further into Corinthians, it's talking about a different tongue. So there is the tongue of angels. There is the the, the tongue of languages. There is the, the tongue of the Spirit. And so, yes, another whole night. But yeah. There's the answer to the argument about tongues is there's five different types of tongue. Does that so, answer that, Sheila? I'm looking. I'm looking in the chat to see if she's. We just don't. I want to make sure that you're not confused. And if I need to go offline with you, Sheila, that's fine. We can talk about that. But I just want to make sure that that cleared that up. I encourage everybody to get their prayer okay. link. Mm -hmm. it is it is a wonderful thing revelation comes out of it but it is not conditional correct it is, it is a gift love is unconditional and so is all of the gifts and all the gifts all the fruits uh, everything that is good is available to us all yeah, sure. Sheila, Sheila said it definitely makes me want to dig deeper. So yeah, that's that's the intent. I don't think that you'll you'll you can dig so deep in him that you'll never hit bottom. So but if you have any confusion or any questions, please, please, please let me know or let Craig down. Go ahead, Rebecca. No, I just wanted to um comment on the I guess on the topic that you guys were talking about. Um, when, when we, um, when we get, when we give our life to the Lord, right? The Bible says that God himself, in other words, his spirit comes and lives inside of you. Now you're, be you become perfect. You become, um, what is, what is it called? Your spirit cannot sin no more. And the spirit of God is living inside of you. And then there is something what he was talking about is you get baptized in the Holy spirit, which is the empowerment has nothing to do with salvation is the empowerment that he gives you, which happened in Acts 19. Because if you read in um, John 20, right? Um, it says here, John 20, verse 21. He said, starting with verse 21, it says, again, he said, peace be with you as the father has sent me. So I am sending you. Then it says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, Right. So if, if you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't, if you do not forgive them, then they're not forgiven. So the disciples, based on based on what, what was studied, the disciples were pretty much saved already. But when they went to the upper room, they were waiting for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. They were waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So everyone that was in that upper room received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people are saved. A lot of people are have eternal security because they have given their life to Christ. They have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They have God himself living inside of them because that's what the Bible says is that God himself is living right inside of you. Christ is in you. Amen. We gave our life to Christ. We died with him. We're now seated with him in heavenly places. 
But there's a difference when you are empowered by the Holy Spirit because the empowerment of the Holy Spirit brings the kingdom of God into your soul. Pretty much the kingdom of God, which he was talking about, is love, peace, joy, all those things you're able to manifest out out of you, out of you because the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that's delivering your soul. So that's where um, I guess a lot of people get that part confused. Is some people are saved that they've probably never been baptized with the Holy Spirit. They've probably never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that has missed out a lot, especially in nowadays, you know, because a lot of people are just set with the salvation part, but they're, ne they're never receiving the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that's what is needed to complete the calling that you have for your life, because it's the Holy Spirit that empowers you to do the things, the, uh, what do you call it? The miracle working, you know, the, um, what is that operate word? Under, yeah, the work, God. yeah, pretty much to operate under the signs and wonders and, you know, with the, the giftings of prophecy, all that stuff is where the Holy Spirit is needed because it empowers you to be able to do all those uh, works that Jesus was doing. Because he said, greater things than this you will do. So uh, that's what took place. Salvation didn't really take place in Acts. All those people were believers already. And you can even see when Jesus invited them after he resurrected, when Jesus invited the, disi the disciples up with 500 people, it was the disciples of 12 plus 500 that he invited up to the mountain before he got resurrected, where he commissioned everyone. All those people believed in Christ. All those people were already believers, but they received the empowerment. That's why he said, go wait and the, uh, go wait for, and don't leave don't leave yet he gave them the commission he commissioned them but he says don't leave yet until the holy spirit comes in other words so that's where they came they all united together and they waited for the empowerment to be able to do the commission you know what I'm saying because you can't go and do your calling without the empowerment of the holy spirit it is that that empowers you to do what god has called you to do and i believe that every believer should be filled by the holy spirit and my brother Greg is right. You know, you need and you have to invite the Holy Spirit to continue, continually fill you, to continually reveal to the soul what is the love of God? How big is the love of God? Because sometimes, like I say, you you already saved. Your eternal destination is secured, right? Because the Bible says you have God living inside of you, right? And the, and the spirit man inside of you cannot sin. Your soul can sin, but not the spirit that's living inside of you, which is God himself. You have been washed by the word, right? So, but the empowerment is what gives us the ability, the endurance um, to, to have all the attributes to the changes that happens inside of us to be able to do what God has called us to do. And that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that a lot of people skip that. They just go straight to the water baptism. The water baptism, all that stuff is needed, but not for salvation, but is needed to be able to identify yourself with Christ but when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, now you are empowered to do what Jesus did on earth. And that's that's what I just, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what I wanted to share. Uh, I, I want to touch base real quick on, and I was going to kind of leave this, I was going to try to leave this alone, but I'm not. There, There's four things and there's four things in accepting God into, into his fullness. Um. The invitation of uh, of Jesus knocking on our door and us opening, uh, hearing and opening the door so he can come into our heart and suck. That's very important. There's salvation. But I think church has missed. The invitation is for us to also step into his heart. I and he and he and me. It's in John 14. It's right there. It stares us in the face. And, and we tend to miss that. It's not taught on very much. So he wants us in his heart as much as we should want him in our heart. The water, I explain it like this, there, that covers our rebirth. The water baptism of repentance gets rid of the afterbirth. It washes us. After, after we've had salvation, we've repented. Now we get the water baptism. And we've just cleared the afterbirth of our rebirth to then invite the Holy Spirit into the baptism of, of spirit and fire. And there's, there's what I see as the four key points to, and I haven't seen anything else, but I think that pretty well covers every direction. Jesus and me, 
I in Jesus, water baptism of repentance, which is not conditional to salvation, and then the spirit baptism with fire, and there's your there's your teacher and your fire, your signs, miracles, and wonders will operate thereafter. And that's just your four step, your four steps in there. Can I say something? Yes. When the, Jesus told them to go to the upper room, they had already believed in him, accepted him, and they wanted to do what he told them to do. So they went up to the upper room and they tarried. And they tarried because he told them, stay there, tarry there until you are endued with power from the Holy Spirit. And they believed him and they did that. And when the fire came down, it came on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them was speaking in tongues when they got the filling. Every one of those 120 was speaking in tongues in languages of the hundreds of different nationalities. It was all around, all over the place. They heard some of these individuals speaking in their tongue. So I'm just, I just want to say, if, if I've got that correct, you know, you get saved, the spirit of God comes in you, and then you get the desire that you, that you want to be filled with the spirit to get the power of God so you can live for him in power and have power all over the enemy. And so when they, when they did what he told them to do and the fire came down, they, they got filled with the spirit and, and they spoke with tongues. So I don't know if that is saying anything different from, from what you all have been saying about do you, have, do you have to speak in tongues to get the Holy Spirit? Well, the, the Bible shows there that when they, when they got filled with the Spirit, they all spoke in tongues. So is that saying that's the way it's supposed to be? I believe that's probably what it is, that when you get saved and then you get filled with the Spirit, you're up at the altar and you're praying and you're saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. All of a sudden, you, you start speaking in tongues. You, so that's the evidence of being filled with the Spirit, I always believe. And then if you want to let it go there and don't let the Spirit keep on leading you and guiding you, and don't have a prayer language, well, that, that's, a, that's up to you. But you're supposed to, as far as I'm concerned, uh, remain filled with, with the Holy Spirit and ask Him daily, to fill you with the Holy Spirit and fire every day, because you're 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 in this world fighting this this evil force that's coming after you all of the time, and you need the Lord's Spirit in, inside of you. You need that power. So I, that's all I have to say. If, if I'm if I'm not correct, somebody correct. I, I got. I'll, I'll jump in on this because I I agree, but I also think that there's a lot of people that don't they're waiting for god to take over their mouth so they approach it wrong and we're going to get you uh um uh, oh i don't know how to say your name Adbidel. i don't i can't say your name i'm sorry um i see your hand i had a lot of religion being brought up through i came through several different religions but I didn't come up through a religion that was in power. So it was something that I progressed into later on, but I had a lot of false teaching that I had to overcome. Now, it's not the lacking of the Holy Spirit. It's not the lack of God's intent, because I believe God intended for everybody to have a spirit language immediately upon the spirit arriving as soon as we were indwelled. I had probably, well, I was, I, I was from four years old saved, but wasn't till I was in my forties till I got Holy Spirit. And when I got Holy Spirit, I wanted my language, but I didn't, but I didn't operate in it. So it took me months. I begged, I pleaded, I cried. I, I wanted it and I wanted it bad. And and finally, I was getting like three words. I finally started getting it. And, and I explain it like I had a pickaxe at a levee. 
and I kept picking and I kept picking until I finally poked a hole in that levee and I got a drip and then the drip started to transform to a pour but the more it poured the more it finally came out and it washed out that levee and when it did I broke loose and I had an unimaginable about uh, amount of outflowing river that was flowing through me and from me but I struggled I struggled to get my prayer language and I knew it was important and I wanted it but I also had to situate things within me I've also seen in ministry where people wait for God to take over their mouth but he's subject to us it's we need to say what we hear and and then we flow the river so uh, and that's um, without contradicting you at all, Frank, because I totally believe he intended us to have that language as soon as the Holy Spirit arrived. Sometimes the devil already got to us with lies and, and bad teaching. So let's, if you you can go ahead and go. Um, Frank, the one thing I wanted to kind of add to that is, is it says that in, in, um, Acts 2, 3, and it says, that, yes, just, and I agree with you. It says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. But the problem, here's the thing, is that there's a comma, and it says, as the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, gave them utterance, right? That's not, that's just, I don't see that as necessarily an absolute requirement or justification that says that you're filled, filled with the Spirit, but it says, as the Spirit gave the utterance, and that kind of goes into the same token of, uh, of the gifts, right? There's nine gifts that we that we'll discuss in Corinthians, but it says as he, capital H, wills. So it's not something. So we're not disagreeing with you, but I don't think I don't believe that that to to say that. Well, if you're not if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. Because I know plenty of people that are filled with the Spirit that went years without it. And like Craig said, there's possible also in that there's, you know, because of upbringings and, and stuff that we've understood and, and believed for years that we're kind of almost sometimes quenching that spirit, that speaking, right? That's that speaking. Um, that's an, that's a communication tool between us and the spirit for, for a reason. That's why there's different types of tongues, right? That makes sense. Frank, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, I had an idea, but I think I might have. Yeah, I, I can't give you the scripture, but I'm pretty sure I remember a scripture in the Bible where Jesus said to them, have have ye received? the spirit since you since you believed now I, I can't tell you where that is but it's coming to my mind have you received the spirit since you believed so whatever that's whatever that's supposed to mean i'm pretty sure uh, i remember that but I, I i can't i think that's covered with it's he also comes upon us but he's also a gift for us within us so and, and I really, I, there's, uh, there's times in the Old Testament that the Spirit was upon them. So they operated with, they co-labored, but it wasn't available to be indwelt with until after the cross. So, and, and that's while the, the Lord of hosts was actually the Old Testament. And then the change of role after the cross was becoming the Holy Spirit allowing the world to go down the rabbit trail of prophecy and the bad and all the badness in the world. But the teacher will be with those that believe with Christ. That's just kind of the changing of roles and, and positional. So go ahead. I, I, um, we, I tell me how um, you say your name. I'm sorry. It's, it's Abdiel. 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 Okay. So I wasn't far yeah. from, yeah, 
So Go ahead. I'm going to lay a lot to you, Craig, because um, I got saved at five years old. And um, I grew up in the church since nine days old. But I wasn't until I don't I'm not saying that it has to be. But for me, this is how it was where it wasn't until after I got baptized physically that I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because um, what when I was little, I always thought like you have to be like mature to be baptized and like at least at a certain age. So when I finally did get baptized at 12, um, I, I knew I already was filled with the Holy Spirit, but it was something where it also can be led by fear, where you don't want to speak in tongues as well, where you're fearing of it because you're nervous to do it. Because I think that was, with, that was with me too. So I was nervous to speak in tongues, so I didn't. And I will only like, the only time that I will ever speak in tongues was when on my personal prayer time where it just came out, where I'd even try to. So tongues is pretty much, it's a tool and it's a part of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's a tool to use to communicate with God. It's not, it's not used to, like, if you're speaking in tongues, that's not a way to tell you're filled with the Holy Spirit because you there's other signs that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can come in through laughter. The Holy Spirit can come in through crying. The Holy Spirit can fill you through, as well as speaking in tongues, but it can fill you through a bunch of other stuff. Like, I've seen people get filled with the Holy Spirit and they're laughing. They're laughing uncontrollably. So... Same thing with tongues. You're speaking in tongues. It all comes through different different ways. Some people they they start they they start getting the tool of speaking in tongues later on after they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's more of um, it's more of like it's a language where it's more of I feel like it's more of a just a direct communication with God that you can only get through your intimate time with Christ. You start getting it when you spend more time with Christ because that's your intimate knowledge, your gnosko knowledge with Him. That's pretty much where he he says you spend time with me, I will show you the the gifts that I can give you. So I I find I find the speaking in tongues is a very very deep theological discussion and it's very interesting when you dig more deep into it. So I just and also I wanted to add on to what my mom said pretty much that um it really upsets me sometimes when churches that they, they go around soul winning and they don't have a discipleship class to offer so what we're doing now is perfect because if you're going around and you're focusing on just leading people to salvation it's hard because how are they going to know what salvation is if you're if they not being taught what salvation is if not if they're not being taught what the holy spirit is if they're not being taught what it means to get baptized in the holy spirit because if you're if you're pretty much, um, if you're pretty much just going around wanting souls to get up your numbers on the church, it wouldn't work out. And also, we're supposed to be operating in a fivefold ministry, so everybody in the church is supposed to have something to do with the fivefold ministry. It's not for you to just sit there and listen to the pastor every two weeks, every two days out of the week. So you're supposed to, you're supposed to gain the whole point of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is to gain in your fivefold ministry. So you'll find out whether you're apostle whether you're prophetic whether you're evangelist whether you're missionary whether you're um a pastor like is or a teacher so the 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 being filled with the holy spirit is not just tongues it's not just laughing it's your gnosko knowledge your intimate time with god that's how you know you're truly filled with him if you can directly connect to christ and you can directly speak to him and you can directly feel his presence over you that's how you know you're filled with the holy spirit so that's Amen. that's what my thing was on. Amen. Yeah, and John, John 14 actually says, um, I'm going back to one of the verses I read because this this clarifies, you know him because he abides with you, comma, and he will be in you. So it specifically states two different two different ways that he is with us. He's with and in. So there is actually that um, different. Yeah, we can differentiate that we've met him, but yet that can also be different from the indwelling. Yeah. So, and, and I encourage both. I mean, we want all of God. It's, he brings all good and great, right? So the more that we can have of him, the better off we are. And we shouldn't have to, um approach with fear we can go boldly go amen. ahead Sean. amen frank uh denise sent you a message and things she said the the verse you were talking about is in acts 19 
she wanted to find it. And that's the one that's, that's the other verse that we talked about at great length too, is uh, John 14 and Acts 19 or two of the verses that if you guys want to study and get into them uh, later on, those would be two good verses. Also Hebrews nine. So I know yeah. that there is a lot of question. Uh, there, this, this topic is, is something that um, definitely stirs up a lot of stuff. So the one thing that I, I want to, before we get any farther is I want to make sure that um uh, I, I rebuke and declare that there is no confusion in Jesus name, because if it, if it's of the Lord, um, there is no confusion. So if there's any confusion being brought in there, that's something that we want to um, extinguish and demolish because that's not, it's not welcome, but you know, the, the complexity and the, and the simplicity of the Holy spirit is so great and also so simple uh, and, and that's, and that's a lot to take in. That's a lot to understand. That's a lot to grasp, you know? So if, if anybody is kind of feeling overwhelmed, don't, don't be overwhelmed. I mean, it's just, you, you can't eat the elephant all, <laughs> all in one bite, you know, there's a lot to him. And, and, and he, like, like Craig said, he's a gentleman. He's going to give you, give you that understanding. He's going to give you that, which you, you need when you need it. And that's simply, that's all you got to do is you go to him and you ask him, okay, can you give me the understanding? Cause I made, there may be some confusion because everybody kind of discussing what they understand and their, um, uh, their spiritual understanding of it is off is, is can be sometimes, I mean, let's face it. Sometimes it's influenced by our upbringing up by what we've been taught, what we've been, you know, all those different things. So, well, in but, knowledge only doesn't, doesn't actually help understanding arrive it's when we start participating mm -hmm. so we we learn about we get taught about this is acts 19 mm -hmm. we get taught about the spirit we learn about it we invite them and then when we start to operate understanding comes so just trying to know and understand up front you can know but not understand you'll have to operate with and all of a sudden you'll be going, oh, I, oh, oh, wow. Hey, I never even realized, you know, so just, just know, work with him and relationally doubts, questions, confusion, all of that just gets washed out and it's, and you find the coolest walk ever. So, and Mary's got something, I think. Um, I, I was going to just keep mine pretty short. <clears throat> when I got saved, I know I had a, um, a Jesus encounter, a Holy Spirit movement in my life. And I was only 12 years old and I was given a spiritual language, although I did not understand it at the time. I thought it was just a child's game, a playmate where I was speaking to someone in the spirit realm. I, did, I didn't know what I was doing. But uh, so after a while, I stopped doing it because I thought it was a, just a child thing. I thought it was just a childish thing and I stopped doing it. Um, and when I was taught anything about the spirit realm growing up, it was stay away, taboo, uh, bad stuff happens there. <laughs> we you don't invite, do that here. <laughs> you invite the, you know, the enemy into your life and all of that kind of stuff. And so I didn't, that's what I, that's what I was taught. So I stayed away. Of course, the spirit realm didn't stay away from me. It, the enemy um, would come because I rejected holy spiritual things in my rejection of the spirit realm. I really rejected the enemy too, but he didn't listen because there was no power backing my words, or at least I didn't believe there was. I'll just put it that way. So fast forward to the future in, you know, seven years ago when I decided that I had enough of the enemy <clears throat> being a part of my life, I knew I was saved. But I had a new encounter with Jesus. And as part of inviting Jesus in, I opened up the spiritual realm. I didn't really even know I was doing it. 
but invited Holy Spirit in because I knew Holy Spirit was the power. I, I intuitively or prophetically, however you want to say it, um, I knew that Holy Spirit was the power. And this is what God gave me in that. God spoke in the beginning. He, God spoke. Breath, life came out of his mouth. But words came out of his mouth. The word is Jesus. And of course, Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus came to the earth as God in the flesh, but he was independent. He had his own body, soul, spirit at the same time. But when Jesus died and the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit, had, well, he's always been the breath of God and the the power behind or the, uh, the power that fulfills the word. So Jesus came, he did his part, and then it was time for the Holy Spirit to come and wrap it up, if you will. That's that's just was the my understanding of the way God gave it to me in each of their roles. God as the Father is to me separate god god sits in his own heavenly realm and he's up there above everything father is a figure that is creator um i mean god is creator too i don't really know how to explain the father figure to to be but it is three Amen. in one that is from god who sits above it all but they each have separate functions and to fast forward to where um, I did go ahead and, uh, you know, ask for Holy spirit to come and live inside of me. Also baptism. I wanted the fire that just really the fire to me, it just set a desire in my heart that I, that couldn't be quenched a desire to know who God is. That's what the fire is for me. It filled me full of love for, for people. Just, it just filled me full of love for people. And when I asked God for the, uh, my, my uh, language, my spiritual language, he said, you already have it. And he reminded me of when I was back when I was 12 years old playing as a child. And immediately it was like I was in two places at one time saying the same thing or praying the same words. They were coming out and I could, it's like I could hear two voices. It was an incredible experience. And it's, uh, it is, scripture says, a way that is edifying to us individually to have our prayer language and to use it and to function in it. And you do get revelation when you're uh, praying in your prayer language. It gives you something to pray when you don't know what to pray. It is beneficial in a lot of different ways. It is not, I don't believe it is connected with your salvation. It never was connected with mine, or at least I didn't see it that way. Even though I got my prayer language and I didn't know what it was. I was saved. And I invited Jesus in my heart. But the power behind my authority didn't really come until I invited the Holy Spirit in. I knew God. I, knew, I mean, I knew Father. I knew Jesus. But I didn't know Holy Spirit. Because I rejected that part because of my teaching of the Spirit realm being bad. But anyways, I, that's... The gist of what I was saying. I think Shannon. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Uh, it's either Rec Rebecca or Andrew. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> no, it's me. Um, it's Rebecca. <laughs> it's just me. Um, <laughs> no, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, we really are, we're really not independent of Jesus or, you know, I, we're everyone, everything is connected in one. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that the Bible says that 
we surrender our bodies in Romans 12, I believe we surrender our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Right. So there is a surrendering of our life of ourselves that we do because our, we are in life union with Christ. The Bible says it's not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. So there is really no separation in the sense where Christ himself is living inside of us. In, the, in other words, he is operating through us as we surrender. He will never force himself to do anything through us, but he is there to pretty much for him to play out his life through us as we surrender our lives to him. When we lay down our lives, we find him. And that is the thing is that the Holy Spirit plays a part in all that, all through that with the empowerment. And, you know, and just with the, I just wanted to say, because the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ, that we're seated with Christ, that we died with him and was raised with him. So there is no separation as far as, you know, like even with the triumph God, everything, everything, including the Holy Spirit, all of us are one in God. So the thing is, is just the thing that I think is just when we look at ourselves in a separate way, and the same thing, even with the speaking in tongues that I did want to touch, that was the original thing, but I was just kind of led into speaking about, because we, our life has been united with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but it's him, what, living in us. So it's actually Christ himself living through us, and that's through the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the representative of Christ. Okay, so the, the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own authority, but it speaks whatever he hears the father speaks so it's almost like there is really no separation when it comes to the holy spirit and as far as you know what he's doing in us is all one we're all connected is everything operates in unity and oneness all together which is what god wants us to do here on earth as if all his believers and everybody operates in unity as one body there won't be no difference and you know one thing is what and one thing is left out but what I'm just trying to say is even in the speaking in tongues, no, I don't believe that you have to speak in tongues to have the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. But why not be able to speak in tongues? I wouldn't limit it as in, um, and I'm just speaking honestly from a, a spiritual standpoint from from the pretty much from the presence of God is the Holy Spirit can move in different, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit can move in different ways. It can laugh, it can cry. Maybe one day you're not speaking in tongues. Maybe one day you are laughing in the spirit. You know, there's people who laugh and stuff. But why can't you speak in tongues? And a lot of times it's not that you not it's not that God doesn't destine everybody to speak in tongues. I, I believe that every single believer who has been empowered by the Holy Spirit could speak and has the ability to speak in tongues because God will not limit one on, uh, out of the other. But I, what I will say is if you haven't gotten there yet, there's nothing wrong with it. But I believe if you truly, if you surrender yourself, because it takes a surrendering side of you, right, which is inviting the Holy Spirit to come to to guide you into and mo and um, show you how, you know, how you will speak. Because it, it takes a surrendering time. It can't be that the um, you do invite the Holy Spirit, but it, it just takes a surrendering side of your end, too. So it is influenced by the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. And I can tell you that from experience is me myself when i became a christian i didn't i was i was just a new newbie christian nobody taught me about the holy spirit nobody taught me about anything and i was in my bed and my literally in my bed i was already saved and i wasn't even baptized yet i wasn't even baptized by water yet nobody told me how to get baptized i was saved already though i gave my life to christ and i was in my bed sleeping and i remember i was half in half out sleeping and I was in my mind I was praying and I was just like Lord I want more of you but I was kind of like almost asleep and I remember something came inside my stomach I started to breathe really hard and I was scared because I had no idea what it was and all of a sudden these tongues like language just started coming out of my mouth and I just I just allowed I just allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me I didn't even I didn't stop I could have I had the power to like I could stop and say you know what no and it wouldn't continue. But I, the thing is, is you allow the Holy Spirit. Remember, you surrender your bodies as a living sacrifice. So it's almost you let God himself operate himself through you as you surrender to the Holy Spirit. So that it takes a sensitive surrendering side of you to allow God to be able to pull out what he wants to pull out of you. Because remember, it's not you doing it. It's him doing it through you. So I wouldn't limit 
you know what I'm saying? I, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't down anybody that doesn't speak in tongues because it's not that you, it's not that you're not meant to speak in tongues. It's, I believe if you have Christ living inside of you, you can do all things that he could do because your life has been joined to him. And that's what I'm trying to explain is because your life is joined to him, you're able to do everything Jesus does and more, he said. So I say, why not? Why not get to that place where I could speak in tongues? Maybe I don't, I'm not doing it right now, but the Holy Spirit is going to end up showing me how to do it because I don't think that he will keep that away from people and say, no, you can't speak in tongues, but you could. I believe that every single believer who has been empowered by the Holy Spirit has the ability because they have Christ living inside of them to speak in tongues. But I'll be honest with you. It takes a very um, uh, surrendering meaning not limiting the Holy Spirit inside of you to do it. And a lot of times, it, I, like even I even witnessed it with Andrew. Andrew never spoke in tongues, ever. And it only happened a few times in his life where he's done it, and I've heard him, and I cried. But it was a moment where he was so empowered by the Holy Spirit, he just completely let go of himself, completely surrendered to the power that was just flowing inside of him, and the tongues just came out. Because in the beginning, when the tongues start to come out, it feels like you're breathing really hard and it feels like you're about to give birth to something in the beginning. But as you continue speaking in tongues throughout the years, it just flows out easily. So in the beginning, it's not that easy to speak it. It comes out, it's like, a, it's, it is a little forceful in a sense where it feels like a big old giant breath is just coming out of your stomach. And it's almost like you could limit it if you get scared, if you get anxiety, you get like, there's a limit part, but I believe that every single person could laugh in the spirit. Every single person could speak in tongues. And every because we remember, we have Christ living inside of us. We have his mind, his spirit in us. And that's where I wouldn't I just say I wouldn't limit it, because when we say that we not everybody could not everybody has to or not everybody. You're kind of saying, uh, well, I don't want to speak in tongues anymore or, you know, or I, I will never be able to speak in tongues. And I, I don't want to. And I'm just saying this because I love everybody. I don't ever want to limit anyone and what God can do in them. So that's why I just wanted to share. <laughs> I'm going to touch one thing. Uh, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, when I talk about the individualism between Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. This is a revelation that a lot of people don't have. So I want to be perfectly clear with this. Through relationship, I have learned each one has their own personality. And I can now recognize what revelation I'm getting from who based on their personality. They are omnipotent. They are three in one. So they are in absolute unity. When I get when I write down and I write down a paragraph from each one of them, they all tell me something very similar. They're absolutely in agreement with each other, but the message comes in a different personality from each one of them. So it's really interesting to get into that kind of a relationship that a lot of people don't even realize is available. I didn't. I, it was something that he showed me and I discovered. I was like, wow. So they are individually an absolute unity with each other. And that is the omnipotent in my perspective. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Shannon, are you going to let Abdiel ask one more question? I promise you, Abdiel is not going to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, nephew. Are you, ask are you asking? <laughs> No, I just wanted to um to like add on to what Craig said. So that revelation that he's talking about, that's um that's something that's very important because uh if you look, I think it's in I forgot what book it's in in the Bible. It, it's a verse that says, "My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge." It's not talking about physical traditional knowledge. It's talking about intimate knowledge, gnosco knowledge, which is the what he's talking about, the revelation. So when you get the revelation. And that's another thing that's cool about being filled with the Holy Spirit is that you start getting revelations, like the no knowledge. So now that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's very important to spend more time with Christ. Spend more time in your intimate prayer because then he will start revealing stuff to you, not just in the Bible. I'm talking just like just sit there 
and just let soak in his presence. Just let him fill you. Because when you when you let him fill you, it's not just about the Bible. Because the Bible, yes, it's amazing. But he'll start showing you verses to do. You don't have to open your Bible and just wait. So, yeah, exactly. Abide in him. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> you are your mother and your father's child, Abiel. <laughs> Shannon, Shannon and me are talking to me today. <laughs> Go ahead, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be real quick because uh, we need to wrap up. What we're actually doing, um, me and Sean failed y'all by not giving everybody the future sessions because half of the questions and half of the talk tonight was going into sessions to come, which was the gifts and the fruits and a whole uh, lot of other stuff. So um, just a couple of notes. Hey, first, Craig, you did an awesome job, but me and Sean didn't expect no less. I, I text him. Me and Sean talk about all y'all. When y'all see our heads go down, we text and we talk about y'all. <laughs> we was talking about Craig. I was like, <laughs> Craig is struggling trying to relate this to the normal people. <laughs> but anyway. I was um, being I swear. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. It was awesome that you actually saw that. I was like, wow. Oh, I know. I know. But um, you did a I great tried job. to keep it on earth. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. You did, you did a good job. And good thing about the speakers who come up, if you have questions after, pat yourself on the back because you got people to think it. And you got your, their minds to work in. And that's what we want to do. This is discipleship training. If basically... You don't have any questions after nobody say anything. We ain't did nothing. So I think you did a great job. One thing that I did pick up, um, Holy Ghost, he gives as we need according to God's will through our obedience, through our faithfulness and just believing. Uh, next is the spirit convicts. That's one part that everybody forgets. When that spirit comes upon you, it convicts you and it separates you from the world. We are no longer of the world. We're in Christ. We water baptism is just like Abdel said earlier. We die. When we come out of that water, we're supposed to shed every all that was attached to us that was a part of the world. We're supposed to shed that, come out of the water, and we are new creation. Well, once that conviction set in, it's a purification. It's a process of sanctification because we are saints. If everybody didn't know that, if you are a believer in Christ, you are a saint. And saint is a, a, a partial word going into saint, a sanctification, which is a sanctification process. So, you know, like a lot of us guys will get together. I My joke thing is I'm leveling up. I'm ready to level up. You know, like taking steps. That is a true thing when you're talking about this whole Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, triune. You are going to level up. It's called maturing in the faith. So once you start maturing and the Lord sees that you're able to handle this power that we have talked about so much, he's going to give it to you if you're willing to receive it. But you have to be separated from the world, from flesh to that point of one, one quick first. I know I'm not going to take long. It was a whole lot of points. And I just went off. There was a guy named Simon. And let me find my verse. What was it? Yeah, Acts chapter 8. I got it. I got it pulled up. I just got to find it. Yep, here it is. And that was verse what? And I can't read that little bit of writing. 17. Acts chapter 8, starting on 17, it says, no, I'm going to back up. I want to start at uh, 13. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So this was a sorcerer that had the whole public in the community. He was doing all this sorcery, and he had them bamboozled. They thought he was the man. But when the real men of God came and they'd done these miracles, he recognized. So automatically, this man in the world of flesh doing these fleshly things recognize the spirit of God, recognize the power that came along with it. Well, if you read on down through scripture, he sees the miracles, he believed, and he followed. So once he believed, doesn't that mean he got that 
Holy Spirit right then, but he wasn't, the indwelling hadn't happened. Because if you read in scripture, he tried to buy it. So it's just like Rebecca spoke. It's just like Craig spoke. He wanted to buy the power. He already, he believed in Christ. And the scripture said he believed in the way. So right then, the Holy Spirit come and it should have brought conviction. It should have brought all these things of separation from the world and this belief in Christ. But now he's seen the power, which was leveling up the maturity. And he offered to buy it. And Peter rebuked him. So that's a big separation. That's a big subject that we'll cover in the gifts and the fruits. Tongues. Woo, we talked enough on that. I ain't got nothing to say about it. Going back, last thing I'm going to uh, comment on. If you go back to uh, Exodus chapter 31, it talks about them building the Ark of Covenant. And a man, it says, was filled with the Spirit. This is Old Testament in Exodus. He said he was filled with the spirit, just like what we're talking about. And he was given wisdom and understanding in metalworking. So he could do all the things of the instruction that God gave Moses to build. So this man had no idea how to do that stuff. And he was filled with the spirit and the spirit gave him understanding. This is what we talk about in the gifts. This is according to the will of God. This is according to his plan. So these gifts that we receive by being willing vessels, after the sanctification of the spirit through conviction, it gives us gifts to produce. And once we start producing, souls are to be saved. Souls are supposed to be coming to Christ through the gifts and manifestation of the Holy Spirit that reside in us as vessels. If that's not happening, how is that edifying the church? How is that building new believers? How is that selling that Jesus is the king of all kings? It's not. That's, that's flesh. That's in the world. So if you're praying for this power, pray first for your vessel, as we always say that reflection, because the Holy Spirit inside of us is a direct reflection of God and the Son. Everybody got that? So if you're praying for that vessel to be clean, if you're praying for that vessel to be humble, then as you mature and you level up, the Lord's going to put you in the spot. He's going to open them doors. He's going to put you in the spots where people need you, where your gifts can manifest. The miracles can happen, but not at our own will, at his will. Because I think we talked, how long ago, Sean, eight, nine weeks ago, talking about uh, if we could flip that switch and activate the Holy Spirit inside of us, we'd be at Sacred Heart healing them babies with cancer. But it's not, that's not, that's our will. That's not in the Father's will. Because if it was in his will, somebody would already been down there and done it. So we can't make this Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, we can't make it complicated. The Holy Spirit will reveal what you need in the time that the Lord sees fit in his will, according to his will. So if you got questions, that's great. You got a lot of people in here that have experienced things and they can answer those questions, but don't complicate it. Just keep reading your word. Keep spending time with God. Keep in prayer. Keep cleansing, going through that sanctification process and the Lord will walk you through it. He will bring you where he needs you to be. And it's simple, simple put. Anybody got anything else? Because we're going to bring on some prayer requests if we have any, and we're going to close out the night before it's 12 o'clock and somebody starts talking about tongues again. <laughs> Anybody? Any uh, prayer requests? Can we teach in tongues? <laughs> hey, put, put Craig on mute. <laughs> so just, just to give you all a little um, precursor, so the following elements of discussion after this if we don't don't go into part two next week will be the gifts of the spirit the fruits of the spirit the promise the testing of faith the provision and then the last one will be the wilderness no so far now that doesn't mean that he won't drive and dictate in different directions and that's the nice part about this is that as long as we're in him we just go where he tells us to go it's that simple you know what's beautiful shop what's beautiful is about every subject that you just said was touched on tonight. Mm -hmm. Almost Good every intro. subject was touched on tonight. Yeah. Why don't we actually bring that second session after we run through the seven? Okay. The the six more. And then it'll kind of be, we'll, we can kind of wrap it back up with that because there's going to be a broader understanding 
as we step into the fruits and the and the gifts and as we move forward you know yep so. absolutely. absolutely any prayer request anybody yeah, yeah. can, you, can you pray for tomorrow and like the next two days i got quarterly exams so just for strength mm-hmm I have some unspoken, but it's but it's simply um, that the Holy Ghost would do some arresting, some heart arresting. John, did you hear Melissa? Did you hear Melissa? No, I did not. I'm sorry. She said, "Pray for her mouth." She had uh, old uh, surgery a couple days oh, okay. ago, and she's still in some pain. Still in pain. Anybody else? I have a friend and she um is eat up with Crohn's. They say the doctor said they're talking about calling in hospice because she can't control her bowels and stuff. So um who's that? Her name is Brandy. I'm just gonna say Brandy. Brandy. Um you said ate up with Crohn's? Yeah, they said it was Crohn. She's had it and she's had it for years and she's down to eighty seven pounds and they're not expecting her to make it. They want to call hospice in. Hmm. Why don't I re rename you as Chris? I don't know. Uh Sean with I just got um uh, we need to add uh Sherry's mom. I know a couple of us got together and we uh, prayed over Sherry and her mother. So now we need to go into prayer for her um her spirit, her spirit woman. Because you know when the doctors say this and the doctors say that, it's easy to go in that mind shift of being doubtful and fearful. So we she has to wait. She has to wait on the Lord to move. And we've already prayed for that. So we need to pray for her strength and her faith. Well we saw that that night. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, I did get a praise, quick praise report. One of our, oh, so I'm going to give you guys a, a quick praise report on what we did this past Saturday. So this past Saturday, um, we had a little bit of a community outreach event down in Niceville, um, had the opportunity to go down there and just basically give out free hugs for about six hours and, and uh, anybody that was there, pray for folks, pray for families. Um, there was about two, I think there was close to 200 booths there between food vendors and small arts and crafts and stuff like that and all that. And we had a, a, a pile of people show up. Brother Frank was out there all day, my sister and brother-in-law, um, uh, Brandy and, and Rachel, and there was all kinds of people, Sister Sue, and they had an amazing opportunity uh, to be the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus. So again, I want to lift them up because they absolutely knocked it out of the park. We we figured that, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say probably close to 750 plus hugs were given out just to random people that were coming by. Um, my brother-in-law, I think he was the hug queen, hug king. Everybody wanted to come hug him. I told Tammy, I said, you better put a leash on him. They're going to try and drag him off. But uh, Finn busted out of his comfort zone and he hit 50 hugs. To, to get lunch in an hour and a half. And he still kept going. So it was awesome. Um, probably close to, I would say probably a hundred different people prayed for, uh, families prayed for um, cancer. I mean, all, all kinds, all sorts of things. So it was a great opportunity, a great day to really be the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus. So I just, I, I want to give that praise report because that was very, very powerful. And I think it broke a lot of people out of um, what comfort zones they might have thought they had. Uh, it really opened that up. It was really, really awesome. So we'll be, we'll be going to, we're going to do that again. And um, so be, be on the lookout for that if you're, if you're local. So um, if nobody else has in. anything, we will close this thing out. I don't see any hands raised and all that stuff. So, all right.
Lord, I just thank you tonight. I thank you for the word that was given, Lord. I thank you for the discussions. I thank you for the teacher tonight, Lord, that you that you spoke through Craig and through all these who shared tonight. I thank you for that because, Lord, in that um, comes confirmation. It comes understanding. It comes uh, encouragement, Lord, and we thank you for that. We we rebuke any confusion in Jesus' name, and Lord, we just continue to lift you up uh, as we continue to grow in you, Lord. We thank you for uh, these prayer requests have been given, Lord, because we're going to say we're going to answer them as as they're done, Lord. We're just thank we're going to thank you on credit for Abdil doing well in his in his quarterly exams, Lord. We're going to thank you uh, on credit that. Um, your heart, that you're going to be arresting the hearts of those who need to be arrested, Lord, that Lord, we just pray that you would continue to, to navigate through all of the, the, er, the worldly junk to get to the hearts of your children, Lord, and convict them to the point that will turn them running back to you, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for the prodigal sons and daughters that will return to you quickly in Jesus' name. We thank you for uh, this pain diminishing and going away that Melissa is, in, is enduring right now because of this oral surgery. Lord, we, we declare a, a complete healing over this surgery in Jesus' name. We thank you for what you're going to do in Brandy, Lord, this Crohn's disease. Lord, we curse it right now. We cursed Crohn's disease and everything that comes along with it, all of its cousins and all of its in-laws. We curse all of that because that was not created by you, Lord against your believers, against your children, Lord. We pray right now that this Crohn's disease would be canceled and that that you would be, you would get all the glory for that, Lord. We thank you for uh Sherry's mom's spirit being strengthened in this in this phase in this battle that she's in, Lord, and this in this storm that she's in, fighting uh doctors reports and all these things, Lord. We just continue to stir the faith that we have within us, Lord, as a body of believers. We stir that faith with your healing and miracle powers, Lord. We just thank you for that, Lord. And we ask that you would continue to strengthen her spirit, Lord, to be prepared for whatever it is that you have for her, Lord. And we just give you praise and honor and glory and ask that you would bring us back at the next appointed time. And we thank you and help ask you for a good night's rest tonight. Wake us up refreshed and anew tomorrow, Lord. And let us be the vessel that you need us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all. Thank you for coming tonight. Have a great night, and we will see you next week. Um, and next week, we will talk about the gifts. So uh, I will, I will try to try to do that. Love y'all. Love you. Good night.